So thank you again so much for the invitation to this seminar. Um, uh, so in this presentation, I want to cover uh, two research projects that we have here at the lab. Uh, first is uh, how can we evaluate a skin tone representation in machine learning applications in the dermatology domain? And in the second aspect is um, how can we enhance uh, models that are already trained for detecting a particular disease uh, to be more robust against out of distribution samples? Um, first of all, I would like to give you an outline. I will introduce you to the team that makes all the results that I'm gonna show today possible and discuss um, disparities that we see in dermatology and then uh, deep dive on the two uh, projects that we're working on, uh, one regarding uh, the furnace aspect and the second one and uh, the robustness models in the skin disease. I also wanted to uh, call out some other interesting work at the lab that maybe you're interested and maybe you would like to collaborate further a part of, of these two. So uh, this is the team. Uh, we are um, uh, research scientists, machine learning engineers, uh, dermatologists, master's students, PhD students from IBM Research in three locations in Yorktown in US, in Zurich, and here in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, we also have internship programs with the students on CMU from Rwanda and Kigali, and the dermatologists are experts from Stanford. Uh, so we know that in, as in other medical fields in dermatology, we may find disparities. So for example, melanoma is often diagnosed at an advanced stage for African-American populations and the survival rates for ALM are 5% higher for Caucasian populations than African-American patients. In this pandemic time, uh, the dermatologists started an international registry to be able to catalog skin manifestations of COVID-19. Uh, but at the moment, uh, since last year till now, um, the database is heavily populated with Caucasian patients and just a few uh, Latin and Black African-American patients. Of course, uh, the clinical domain is aware of these gaps and they're already working on it. Like for example, Malone Mukwende uh, working on mining the gap and, and describing clinical uh, signs in Black and brown skins. Uh, but what we want to call this out is because when we are building our machine learning solutions, we need to make sure that we are asserting these same disparities so we don't translate these to our technical solutions or even deepen uh, uh, this, this type of disparities. So in this talk, I want to go over two questions. Uh, first question, if the question if the data sets that we use in dermatology and machine learning to benchmark are biased respect to a skin tone and if we can uh, quantify these. The second question is uh, when we have these state-of-the-art models for uh, skin disease prediction, are those robust against uh, clinical setting changes like different type of hardware taking the, the data input or uh, are they robust against unknown disease samples? What happened when my model is trained over 10 different uh, disease classes, but I left out two apart? What happens when they receive those new samples? So for the first question, um, there is a lot of work in the literature on state-of-the-art uh, machine learning models for skin diagnosed, particularly melanoma diagnosis. Uh, Nature, a few years back, uh, with deep learning models, they showed that they could outperform training dermatologists on detecting melanoma. Also, there is a huge community. You have the ISIC challenges. They hold a lot of the standard data sets used in dermatology. They launch different tasks like segmentation, um, segmentation of lesions, uh, detection of particular skin diseases, 
And in the other hand, uh, we have work on fairness in computer vision with respect to skin type. So for example, Bulwami and Gebru work on the face image analysis for gender classification and analyze what happens uh, across different skin tones. And there is also work done to analyze skin variation in pedestrian detection system thinking for autonomous vehicles. So, so when we wanna address the first question is actually bridging these two spaces. We don't wanna build a new uh, model that will classify skin disease. We wanna take what is already there uh, that is well performing and actually analyze how is the representation, how is the fairness of those models when we analyze different skin tones. So at the moment when we were working, there is no label data that you will have information of the dermatology image and the skin tone. So we need to build a framework to be able to estimate the skin tone and then we can stratify the classifier performance and so on and the data sets. Uh, so this work was done by a uh, team at Newton and it was presented on Mikai last year as part of the internship here at our lab. Uh, so, so in the next couple of slides, I will be showing uh, some skin disease examples. So I just want to uh, put the warning out in case it could be triggering or, or sensitive, please disengage. Just come back uh, just to let you know. Uh, so for this first framework, we tested two commonly used data sets. Uh, these are ISIC 2019 and SD198. Uh, the first one is thermostopic images. So these are very normalized, standardized uh, ways of, of taking the data. And then we have clinical images that the hardware, what the image was taken, changes, uh, body parts are, are different, is more in the wild data set than the demoscopic images. So the first step that we need on our pipeline is being able to uh, get pixels that are from the non-lesion area because the pigmentation of the lesion could change the skin tone uh, um, estimation. So we need to make sure that we are only using quote unquote uh, healthy skin pixels. Uh, so for that, we fine tune in a mask on CNN. Um, after, after we tune in for both data sets, basically what we only need to do is some thresholding techniques to have a binary label uh, output as you see on the bottom. Uh, the pixels that you see in white are the ones that are excluded from the skin tone estimations as are part of the lesion and the rest is going to be used. Uh, why we use uh, transfer learning? First of all, uh, reduce overfitting for sure. And the second one is um, uh, compute time. Uh, the data sets for a skin are, are small and not like the ones that we can see for street views or semantic segmentation um, and, and on, only need a, a little bit of, of time during training and validation. So after we have uh, the region of non lesion areas, we need to characterize this with a metric that give us an idea of lighter and darker skin tones. For that, uh, we can find individual topology, AGO, uh, that is highly correlated with melanin index. After we have these values, of course, we need to bin this um, to have some categorical information. Um, of course, this is open and, and we tweak depending on the dermatology professional um, opinions or the population that they wanna study. But just to give you an idea, everything above uh, 45 uh, is going to be lighter skin tones and let's say below 15 is going to be darker skin tones when we estimate. So some preliminary results that we have on IC 2019, the most topic image, we can see that we have high accuracy for, for the segmentation and both the ETA calculation. 
um, you can see examples of what looks like a, a very light skin tone and a more tan, tan tones. Of course, uh, when we look at the more open data set with different body parts and so on, um, the accuracy load um, decreases a little bit and, and the ETA calculations are a little bit higher. I will show you work that we did afterwards to, to improve these results. But at the moment, that was something that we need to, to further work a little bit more. But when we have these two blocks already built, uh, we have the way to segmentate the, um, the non lesion skin and we can estimate the eta values. We can run this through the whole, uh, both data sets. And what we found, it was like uh, the, both, both of these standard data sets were heavily skewed to Caucasian populations. So we don't actually have too many samples from new and tan or, or more darker skin tones. Uh, this type of information we believe that is important to, to share rather if you are taking to production your model, you're trying this to a clinic, you have to be explicit in which population the model was trained and tested and, and where probably could fail um, if shifts from this type of distribution. So um, the next step that we did, and this came from, from dermatologists, was actually they were interested in measure what was the representation of the skin tones that they use in universities to teach other dermatologists. How are our professionals learning the, um, the, the the area, do they are exposed to darker skin tones uh, examples during their training or not? So there are a few papers that do this manually, uh, but these dermatologists contact us in the paper, how can we translate similar pipeline to actually uh, apply to textbooks? As you can imagine, uh, images from uh, from textbooks in PDF is way different than the standardized clean it up uh, machine learning data sets. So we were dealing first with uh, getting out of uh, microscopic images, diagrams, tables, and so on. Uh, in the first batch, I think we processed three uh, main dermatology books. Out of those, they had 30K of images with everything and only with the skin, I think it was at the end 4,000. Um, and of course, it's, it's, more, um, it's more on in the wild uh, than other that sets. So this work, some preliminary results were presented by, by GearMind, the AAAI workshop on transworthy AI for healthcare. Uh, right now we are doing uh, the full uh, paper ver version, but you can see to the left the distributions uh, for each book. Uh, of course, we have annotated data from dermatologist professionals, and we got to see uh, to be able to generate some uh, similar percentage. And in all of them, we have like 10% or less of uh, proportions of pictures of darker skin tones examples. So, so we can see the lack of, of these samples also in textbooks, not only in, in machine learning data sets. So now to the second question. So we were interested in to see if we can take models off the shelf already trained and we can provide an extra robustness on inference time against these um, distribution shifts like clinical setting changes or these unknown disease samples. Um, so for that, we use again, uh, similar data sets, uh, dermastopic that we know uh, uh, that are taken with the same device, same protocol, and we left out two classes of, of melanoma of melanoma out, 
and train the models and see what happens when the same models receive a sample that they don't know to which class um, they, they belong. So for this, uh, we use substance scanning. So basically we were applying um, pattern detection methods on the activation space of the trained model. So I think the best performing uh, for this case was a dense net. Uh, so basically what we can do is analyze the outputs of each layer and see which activations are behaving differently than normal. And then we can score and, and say, um, these samples looks odd and these are the nodes that, that trigger that, that alert. Uh, this work is being presented by Hannah, our intern from last year uh, on OOD KDD. So for more details, I think every, for everything we have an archive version uh, for sure. So the idea of substance scanning is that we are treating the deep neural uh, network as a data generating system. Um, so we are, we are analyzing the activation space rather than what the input looks like. Uh, substance scanning has some properties to search because as you already probably thinking, uh, searching for a group of nodes in an active in in one layer it's going to be a huge space to search for um some good is that we find using this methodology is that we can provide uh the detection at runtime uh we don't need any retraining of the models we don't have information of what the different sample looks like we only have an assumption of what we know, what normal samples uh, pass through the network. And the other important thing is that we can abstract for the domains and focus only on the, on the representation of the model. So why is this important? Because in clinical settings, you can find OOD detectors for particular cases. So having a setup for uh, change on the hardware or having a setup for, for a new class problem, for example. The same goes if you're working with audio or with images, as we are working on the activation space that give us um, some um, abstraction of, of that type of domain problem. So our, our assumption when we conduct these experiments is that the activation from the unknown condition or, or the change on the, on the hardware device have a different distribution of, of the p-values um, of the activations from the normal samples. So for us, a p-value is the proportion of background activations or no hypothesis for us is what is quote unquote, looks normal in the activation space that are drawn from the same mode from several clean samples. And these are greater than the activation from the test that we wanna evaluate. So let me give you an example on how we can score one sample at one given node of a layer. So for this, we, we wanna use the scoring functions on the evaluation of the new sample in order to measure how much uh, these values deviate from uniform. So I thought that we can use uh, parametric scoring functions in this method like Gaussian or Poisson, the distribution of activations uh, within a layer uh, are highly skewed and in some cases by model. So that's why we use non-parametric scan statistics. So we make minimal assumptions on the, on the distribution of the node activations. And this enables us two things, to scan across very different layers of very different models. Uh, we can we can apply uh, this search method on recurrent neural networks, on CNNs, ResNets, and so on, because we have a non-assumption of what the distribution will look like. 
So basically now what we take is this same search for each node, we search for the highest scoring of this subset of nodes that will give us the maximum deviance from the uniform. So this would be the most anomalous subset of nodes that trigger an image. So in this case, I'm only going to talk about individual scanning. So actually, we're only looking for a group of uh, nodes in a layer that made that sample we trigger as anomalous. But we also have another option of search space that is group scanning. And then we can search not one image, how the activation of the space look like and what is the output, but rather of this group of images, uh, which are uh, the group of nodes that activate. So you can have a group search of multiple image being anomalous and multiple nodes being anomalous. So let me uh, give you a quick step by step on how we actually apply this. So we will have our trained, trained dense net model and we want to extract the activations from them. We will have for both what we call background images or samples that we know that they are clean or they are normal like they were trained. This will mean uh, only classes from samples from classes from one to 10 on the example for new class. And we will do the same for evaluation samples. So evaluations could be, we don't know, could be normal or could be from the new class or could be from the out of distribution. So after we have these uh, activations for our samples, we need to compute the empirical p-values. We need to filter by an alpha threshold that we can discuss a little bit, but how to tune that is also a little bit empirical. Um, but we form the distribution of what we expect in the activations at each node. For that, we pass uh, the, model, the images process, uh, the network process the images as a forward pass that are known to be clean, that we don't have anomalies there, and we record the activations at each node. Then we need to score the test images. Uh, again, this could be clean, this could be noise, and, and we record the activation again. And the comparison results between uh, what we expected, what was our known hypothesis, what we see in evaluation, is how we get the, the p-values. After we have all these p-values, we quantify the anomalousness by finding these, uh, the subset that maximize this, this non-parametric score function. So out of this pipeline, we get two things out. We get the anomaly score that will give us uh, if we should flag or not flag uh, a sample. And the second one will give us the activations uh, that contribute to that score. Uh, that could be useful for interpretation of the models to see which nodes are activated with something happening. Also, they are useful when we think about retraining models in, in only specific areas. So some preliminary results that we have here on the dermatology, in the dermatology settings were um, two things. First, uh, we can see that the scores that we have for uh, clinical setting change uh, behave differently across layers than the ones for the new class program. So the unknown disease problem. So if you see uh, the green and the yellow plot, these are two different classes that they were not trained, but they behave similarly, while the red one belongs to data that is uh, a change in the, in the input data, like how hardware illumination issues and so on. So not only we can flag uh, that a sample is potentially potentially out of distribution, but we can have a, a, a gross sense of what's the source. Um, a part of, of having OOD, of course, as, as we were working on, on a skin tone representation, we wanted to make sure which were the performance of this OOD across different skin tones. And something that we're currently working a little bit more, but preliminary results already show this, 
is that we have a lot of uh, variance changing between layers in the performance for darker skin tones. And of course, our hunch is to say that this instability is, is maybe partially uh, because the network was trained on a data set that heavily lacks samples of darker skin tones. Uh, but we are working on more metrics to be more precise, but that was like the first hunch that, that we also didn't see other OOD detections doing this breakdown by skin tones in dermatology. So some conclusions that we have from here and, and some future work uh, that we're currently working on is, as, as you already saw, uh, the two skin disease at the beginning data sets were heavily biased uh, towards light, lighter skin tone. Most of the population was Caucasian. We also saw the same on IC 2019, that was another standard data set. Um, with subset scanning, we can provide the OOD detection for multiple scenarios and have some information of the source. We will not treat everything as the same OOD. We can have some information if this refers, uh, like an image could be in distribution because it's a well-formed image, but it's from a different disease that the network doesn't know, or is completely out of distribution and it has another different setting to take the picture. Uh, so currently we're working on, on better segmentation models for clinical image. This means on the wild, uh, those improvements are being done for the particular for the textbooks and in a few months we should have the demo out. Uh, we are also working on stratifying the skin tone by skin tone and by disease because of course you don't have the same percentage of uh, population of uh, disease happening to everyone equally. So we need to study further uh, by disease. And also always asking how a fair distribution would look like in each case. So two cents that I will give for the methodology for any uh, applied machine learning pipeline will be uh, to work on interdisciplinary teams. Uh, we cannot be all computer science people trying to solve dermatology problems. We need the main experts that can help us. They will know a lot of, of, of information and, and, and context that we need. Um, the researchers, the engineers have to be more diverse, more or equally diverse than the users. We cannot build these models uh, mostly on Caucasian population, launch it to the world and say everyone can use it because it, it will not work or, or we will have unintended consequences. And, and lastly, I think being explicit is, is the best way when we are taking a model to, to a pilot or something, just show uh, the constraints, the limitations, the type of data that was trained on, being explicit and uh, don't lead anything to the person to discover to the end user. They should know in what was trained, where, when it works, when it doesn't work and, and so on. So uh, I would just quickly, I wanted to mention, uh, there is a very nice machine learning in healthcare team in the lab, mainly or heavily in global health. Uh, they are currently working on, on automatic stratification of health data, like survey data. Uh, and they're actually finding unsupervised methods to be able to show you uh, subgroups of populations uh, in that have a given outcome. So this is not even talking about machine learning. This is just looking for vulnerable populations in a given study. So policymakers, uh, they will not like to use, of course, a deep learning model there, but they will like to see in their data alone, which are which populations are being vulnerable Maybe, you know, you can, you can, as a human, we can cross a few covariates, 
but, but we can actually search in a huge space that can give us a bunch of covariates that creates a, su not a super, but a complex uh, subgroup that we need to study. I, I love that work. Uh, I think it's super interesting and we're having a lot of uh, feedback from, from policymakers and domain experts. And more on the deep learning side of life, um, we are using this, this idea of substance scanning over the activation space in detecting adversarial attacks, um, characterizing what creativity looks like in generative models, and, and detecting also fake content, uh, or like if an image was modified or not. So thank you so much. Uh, hope it wasn't too long. I hope open to questions now. Thank you. <laughs>